On behalf of uh, Sapper Cyber Power of Tigray, I would like to welcome our frequent uh, visitor, Professor Galaudius, and we are very appreciative for your uh, time and for your relentless drive uh, to put in light uh, so many of uh, the issue related to politics and starvation and so on. And uh, once more, thank you and welcome to Cyber Power of Tigray. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Barakat Kiros uh, and Ephraim as well of uh, Cyber Power of Tigray for giving us this uh, opportunity to express ourselves uh, of the dire situation in Tigray with respect to uh, famine. And then uh, I will proceed uh, following your your interviews and explain myself. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Galaudius. Yes, uh, uh, what's going on in Tigray is uh, a tragedy that can be averted easily, but uh, politics is uh, sinking in 
in another form to humiliate and destroy the indigenous people of the Gray. Hundreds of thousands may, might serve to death in Ethiopia, the Gray region, according to government official linked copy, uh, notes taken uh, at a meeting of humanitarian workers uh, that uh, we have uh, received this information. And the government of Tigray Emergency Coordination Center, ECC, is assessing the needs of the following in the conflict area. One of the, the federal government declared victory, as, in, as you know, at the end of uh, November, but uh, the fighting continues on. And uh, the patriotic try to grant support at achieving so much uh, uh, victory. <coughs> uh, the United Nations also said access in parts of the Gray is limited, uh, uh, but in some aid is getting through. I don't know how reliable it is, but uh, what I am hearing from relatives and people who visited or who came from Tigray, uh, or according to a link in notes taken to participate at the uh, emergency coordination center, uh, a lot of people are uh, dying while they were asleep. And this is a tragedy, the tragedy that can be afforded. So just coming back uh, to you, uh, what brought us today, uh, we'd like you, I would like you to shed that, some light on the looming female integrity that has been reported uh, by Washington Post uh, yesterday, January 17, 20, 2021. Uh, can you elaborate by that uh, in a very, uh, uh, just uh, in a very simple way, what it entails uh, for those people who are not able uh, to read? That's very good. Okay, what I'm going to do actually is uh, so that our subscribers benefit from what we're talking about. And the world should know what's happening on the ground in Tigray. I will actually completely depend today, unlike other days that I do my own explanations, I am going to completely depend on the Washington Post report of yesterday that he just mentioned, uh, because that is the most recent, uh, the most uh, 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 correct assessment of the situation in Tigray. So the title uh, of the report is Extreme Urgent Need, Starvation Haunts Ethiopia's Tigray. Okay, this is the Washington Post of the yesterday. January 17, 2021, reported at 3.30 a.m. from Nairobi, Kenya. The uh, reporter or the writer of this story is Kara Anna of Associated Press. And Kara Anna is going to report everything for us. And I have actually jotted down the most salient, the most important points, highlight only. I did not take the whole thing. So it says, uh, 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 emaciated from emaciated refugees uh, to crops burned on the brink of harvest. Starvation threatens uh, the survivors of more than two months of fighting in Ethiopia's Tigray region. You see? Because Abi Ahmed actually planned to uh, 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 <laughs> completely finish his war in three days, but now we all know it's almost 80 days. So he's frustrated. The only thing he can do now is starve the people, starve them to death, actually. Okay? And then it continues. Children dying from diarrhea after drinking from rivers. Shops were looted or depleted weeks ago. More than 4.5 million people need emergency food. Hundreds of thousands might starve to death. There is an extreme urgent need. I don't know what more words in English to use to uh, <coughs> scale up 
the humanitarian response because the population is dying every day as we speak. This was said by Mari Carmen Viniola, Vinolas, head of the emergency unit of the Doctors Without Borders that told the Associated Press. Okay? And then it further, further I quote now. It is a daily reality to hear people dying with the fighting consequences, lack of food. This was a letter written by the Catholic Bishop of Adigrat. Hospitals and other health centers, crucial in treating malnutrition have been destroyed. And then Father says, food has been a target. We can talk about this actually later on with the with Father questions that he's gonna bring. But food has become a target now. So this is the politics of, of famine, I say. Incidentally, my dissertation that was published and written some three decades ago, 1990, the title is, uh, I have the book right here. The title is The Politics of Famine and Strategies for Development in Ethiopia. Okay, and I have something in here during the dark period. Same thing happened like this one. As they say, history repeats itself. So that's the first thing we have to do. Yeah, I'm coming back uh, to your dissertation. I know this question relates to that. And I am not naive to say, what is hunger? Uh, as you know, being free from hunger and maintain access to food is a, a fundamental perception underpinning our modern human society. The right to food is considered as one of the most important human rights with some scholars, just like you stating that the right to food has been endorsed more often with a great unanimity and urgency that most other human rights. Yet, for instance, there was a deliberate starvation and creation of women has emerged uh, in a dramatic fashion. I mean, we'll talk about, for instance, Syria, Nigeria, and also Myanmar. Can you shed in light of those uh, how it has been used as a weapon. Very good, very good. What he just brought actually are very relevant to what is happening in Tigray now. Uh, uh, deliberate starvation means politics of famine. Politics of famine. That's what I said actually in my dissertation written some 30 years ago now. Because uh, during, I'm gonna come back to that, but I wanna read first, what the Derg military government did with respect to famine in Tigray. In my dissertation, I'm gonna actually read from my dissertation itself because it's so relevant. Look, this is what happened actually, way back in 1984-85. This is the second major famine in Ethiopia. The first one was during the Emperor of uh, Emperor Haile Selassie, 1973. In 1984-85, there was another major uh, famine in Ethiopia. And then I say, given the incessant civil strife, uh, the politics of famine in Tigray, and this is applicable to all other contending areas, could be manifested in three levels, in three different levels. Number one, denial of food, of, uh, denial of food to famine victims who, in one form or another, had contacts with the TPLF. Their cadres ordered that relief food be not given to people at Koram, Alamata, and Megale in 1984. Two, resettling famine victims against their will. You remember they have taken them all over to Wallaga, Ilibabra, and what have you, from Tigray. And number three, unleashing war against people in contested areas and destroying crop. Look, they were destroying crop too, like what they're doing, the Sha'biya and APLF and what the Eritrean troops are doing now in Tigray. It's the same thing. The Derg was doing the same thing as well. This is from my dissertation now. Now, going back to what he just told me or asked me, 
the deliberate starvation or politics of famine happened in many, many areas. In Syria, it happened because, because they want to starve the people who were against the, the, the various combatants in Syria. So they're blocking, they're blocking, they're blocking food uh, uh, distribution to those, to those areas in Syria. And then in, he mentioned Nigeria, northeastern Nigeria, where the Boko Haram operates, actually. The same thing happened. Actually, in there, they said, surrender or die. If you surrender, surrender. If you don't surrender, you're going to die. We're not going to give you food, period. They've done that. In Myanmar, Myanmar, Myanmar was formerly uh, 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 Burma. Uh, Burma. It was Burma, actually, if you remember. Starvation through destruction of farmland and villages to combat the Rohingya, the Rohingya militants. It's the same thing now, because the IB government, the Eritrean troops, could not defeat the TPLF. They are trying to starve uh, the population in Tigray. It's very similar, very similar in many, many ways. So that's the deliberate uh, 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 starvation of the people of Tigray. But interestingly, what I want to add here is um, uh, there was, an, uh, there was a, a, an imagery of uh, satellite imagery of the uh, Shire, Shire, Shire area of Tigray. Uh, a UK-based research group found two warehouses structures in the UN World Food Program at one of the refugee camp had been very specifically destroyed. You see the food, the food, the UN food program was deliberately destroyed. And the, the, this was examined by the US based, uh, by the UK, I'm sorry, United Kingdom based research group. Thanks to satellite, they can see it now from, from heaven, heavens as a matter of fact. And then it says, in the town of Adigrat, Adwa, Aksum, the level of civilian casualties is extremely high in the places we have been able to access. These are doctors without borders. And then they continue. You go 10 kilometers from the cities, 10 kilometers from the cities, or six miles from the cities. Uh, what you have to have is complete disaster no food at all, no food at all. So people are gonna starve. That's why they're saying now that thousands of people might die in Tigray. So it's a dire situation. The global community should act immediately, immediately. This is what I wanna underscore. They cannot wait. They cannot wait. I'm if they wait, thousands are gonna die. I'm gonna okay? But uh, the global commitment uh, towards this food security, uh, as you know, in considering evidence of uh, famine and starvation, the dynamics of politics and humanitarian concern are and often become muddled, you know, under sovereignty and all kind of, uh, you know, the United Nations cannot access unless, you know, the Ethiopian government have fully acknowledged and having, uh, you know, a free access to that area. That the process of uh, uh, declaring a female by the United Nations is a clear example with food security analysts frustrated by the political constraints. How do you see this in the light of what's going on in Tigray? Okay, that's a good question. It's a good question, but the, the, Tigray, the situation in Tigray now is, as you very well know, complex and very complicated by the realities on the ground itself. However, by global reach out, what I mean is uh, the European Union, the United Nations should really, really act immediately. This is an urgent thing, urgent thing. The European Union by far, by comparison, is the best in terms of challenging the Abiy Ahmed government. The United States was lagging behind due to complications of the transition that's taking place now. But by the time 
uh, uh, Biden assumes uh, uh, power officially after Wednesday. Wednesday's inauguration. I can't wait myself. I cannot wait. I'm sure Biden is going to act because Biden has already condemned the war in Tigray. His uh, uh, Secretary of State Blinken condemned the war in Tigray. And the National Security Advisor of Biden also condemned the war in Tigray. So they're going to be consistent. There is no, there is no such thing like Trump and all those things. Biden is serious. He's going to do it. He's going to do it, I'm sure. But what should have happened, actually, is the United Nations Security Council should have acted. Uh, you remember, Barakat, we have written a letter to them, the Tigray Global Advocacy Group, so that they intervene. They, they had a discussion, they had a meeting, but they never acted. What we need now is action, actually. If the UN Security Council uh, 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 observers could go where there is fight, fighting all over, why can't they go to Tigray? What's the problem? If they could have, they, they've been involved in Congo, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in many, many places. What, what is the problem with these people? Why can't they go to Tigray as well? Because there is war going on, famine going on as well. And we have underscored in our letter that there is a kind of genocide going on in Tigray, deliberately killing group of people, villages and what have you, okay? So uh, I'm really sorry to say that the United Nations Security Council did not do anything. They should have done this a long time ago. But I hope after Biden comes, they will do something. Yes, uh, the irony, uh, Professor Galarius, the irony is that in 2000, uh, the United Nations Security Council observed that the deliberate targeting of civilian population to other uh, protected persons and the committing of a systematic flagrant widespread violation of international humanitarian and human rights laws in situation of armed conflict may constitute a threat to international peace and security. And that's what is happening in Tigray, a proxy war. So I agree fully, yeah. they should have acted mm -hmm. immediately, but they are not. How, do we, push? How do we push in order to have an action plan? What is needed uh, among the diaspora, especially, you know, now our, you know, leaders are being hunted, killed, this is also a flagrant of international law. What do we do? Okay, that's, that's a good one. Anyway, to what you just asked now, uh, I really, really want to uh, 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 thank our Tigran colleagues in the diaspora, because since the war started on November 4, relentlessly, they've been fighting all over, demonstrations everywhere. Uh, as re recent as last week, uh, there were three day demonstrations in Geneva, nonstop. You guys have done it in Seattle too. And so many people have done it all over the world. We've been lobbying congressmen and uh, senators and what have you. So this is what we can do actually, really. We are individuals, we are groups. We're not a country. We are diaspora people but we can make a, a difference by lobbying the highest uh, officials of any country, whether it's Germany or Scandinavia or the United States, it doesn't matter. We have to be the voice uh, for the Tigrayan people. They are the voiceless people now. We should be their voice. They are actually dying and the fighting forces are sacrificing themselves and we in the diaspora should do something to not only extend help to the people in Tigray, but other, other humanitarian organizations should actually know about Tigray as well. Other progressive governments should know about Tigray as well. Okay? That's why I keep on saying I cannot wait for Biden to come. 
for the White House. Before we go to our next question, and I would like to stress, uh, we already talked about the United Nations Security Council. Yeah. And I want to stress that also the statute of the International Criminal Court, ICC, also listed uh, starvation as a war crime in the international conflict. And it's yes. decision on crime against huma humanity and genocide could potentially be used to persecute the starvation. <coughs> Addressing the United Nations Security Council in March uh, 2018, the UN Under Secretary General for Human Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator called on UNESCO to take measures to invest, investigate violation of uh, violation of international humanitarian law, which is the starvation starvation use indiscriminate weapon of war uh, to enhance accountability, what is determines the law that has been broken. Why is we talking about just uh, in terms of genocide? Uh, you know what is taking place uh, on uh, uh, our community, but you know through using food as a weapon is also a part of genocide. Why we are not talking much about it? Well, we're talking about it now. Yeah, now Be because we're talking about it now. But early on, you remember in many of our meetings. And uh, in, in our attempts to lobby the different governments, we've actually brought uh, the predicament, the problem that the Tigrayan people are, have uh, been facing for the last two months and plus. But, uh, in, but most importantly, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, um, uh, is interested in mainly one genocide, to war crimes against humanity and the crimes of aggression. All this is happening in Tigray now. But there is one major problem. The ICC was established according to the Roman statute. Uh, and there are more than 140, 150 countries that have signed and became members of the ICC. The ICC is headquartered in Netherlands and in New York City as well. They have two offices. So they actually look after criminal elements, criminal leaders. Uh, but Ethiopia is not a member of the ICC. Eritrea is also not a member of the ICC. So the only thing we can do is pressurize, pressurize like uh, via, via the United States and other countries uh, to bring them to bring them to justice. Those two individuals who are now in charge and actually responsible for the thousands of people that have died in the last two months due to war. Uh, Isaiah's work is responsible for the destruction of many, many institutions uh, and factories and industries and farmlands in Tigray. By the same token, Abiy Ahmed is responsible too for the deaths of thousands of Tigrayans by bringing non-Ethiopian troops, Eritrean and Somali, and the United Arab Emirates. <laughs> Can you imagine the United Arab Emirates involved in Ethiopia? So in fact, these brave fighters, the Tipi Allah, I really, really admire them for fighting in four different corners. It's not easy. It's not easy. Sometimes we say, why can't they do this? Why can't they do that? But the situation on the ground is extremely, extremely challenging. Let alone fighting in four different corners, four different. Imagine the Eritreans brought 20, around 20 divisions. We're talking about some 200,000 fighters. <laughs> they don't know. Tigray, the land very much like the TPLF do, but they can make uh, a, a major challenge on the northern part of Tigray. It's not easy. The Amhara militia came on the western frontier, which is Dansha and Sagade, and the Ethiopian Defense Force came from the south, along with the Somali from Mogadishu. <laughs> Imagine. So fighting with all these four forces is not easy. It's not easy, really. But history is going <laughs> to, it seems to me, history is going to tell the whole world 
these brave Tigrayan fighters are gonna survive, not only survive, prevail over these forces. So we'll see, we'll see what's gonna happen. Sacrifices I mean, are everywhere, people are dying, uh, but ultimately they can come out as victorious from this uh, complicated situation. Uh, that's what's gonna happen, I think, I think, but we have to wait and see. It's gonna happen. I mean, they are held in their ground. I mean, any Tigrayan should be proud of uh, what mm -hmm. they achieved so far with the meager resources they have. I mean, as you say, this is a web of uh, human uh, destruction from all corners and to sandwich uh, the people of Tigray. And this is what it's really proper them to fight, you know, for uh, our survival, <coughs> for the survival of the nation. And everything Tigrayan should be proud of what they have accomplished so far. And we have to continue our support because we are fighting a just war. Coming back to the second question, uh, okay. uh, the light of the Washington Post uh, uh, January 17 article. According to your reading, what is the condition of the famine stricken people in Tigray? Just right now, we know we touched a little bit, but. Yeah. What's the condition if the aid is not coming in a couple of weeks? What kind of diehard situation? I mean, we are talking about also famine and medicine, all things that are associated with basic human life. How okay, 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 okay. That's a good question. Uh, uh, I've already read the, the Washington Post report coming from Karaana and coming from the uh, doctors without borders. However, as far as I'm concerned, the situation in Tigray now is dire, extremely serious and urgent. Extremely serious and urgent. I have to underscore that. I want to say, I want to repeat myself. It's extremely serious and urgent. Urgent, okay? People need food. Food is the most important thing first, as you already acknowledged early on. The first human rights is food, actually. They need food. They need something to eat, okay? After that comes medicine and shelter and clothing. All those things are now going to be, the ones I just mentioned, are going to be really uh, not that uh, uh, urgent. But food is urgent. They need something to eat. However, in relation to this one, uh, in my research, what I found today in, in relation to that Washington Post report is uh, 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 there are what we call, uh, what we call the common early warning systems network. They, they can do it via satellite or you can research on the ground by, but you cannot do it now because everything is blocked. Okay? So the Famine Early Warning Systems Network. This is funded by uh, uh, and managed by the United States. They say actually uh, the most hard hit uh, part of Tigray is Central and Eastern Tigray, according to their finding. And they, they actually evaluated it as uh, emergency phase four. There are phases like one, two, three, four. Emergency phase Phase four means a step below famine. That's how they defined it, a step below famine. So some of them are already starving. There were some people who made it to the border of Sudan. In fact, they have entered some to Sudan as well as refugees. And those people who uh, interviewed those refugees said actually these were extremely weak uh, uh, and walking skeleton type people because they are malnourished now. They have not been eating food for a long period of time, a couple of weeks, three weeks, probably months, okay? So they've been surviving by just eating something on, on, on their way to Sudan from the jungles and what, whatever that is. God knows what they were eating. So they've seen them, they're skeletons. They call them skeletons. So the emergency for phase four 
is dangerous because it's a wide, wide scale hunger. Wide scale hunger, famine by definition is a wide scale hunger. That's the difference. Hunger could be everywhere. There's hunger in the United States too, but it's not famine. Famine is nationwide, countrywide. It envelops the whole country actually, or the whole population, okay? So that's the situation. It's very dire and extremely urgent. Yeah, coming back, uh, you, you touched a little bit uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, as you know, in 1985, uh, United States Agency for International Development and USA Department of State, uh, uh, after the famous in the East and West of Africa, the famous early warning system network that you talked about combines information analysis uh, from government and geo journalists, researchers like you, and agency, why they are not acting in Tigray? That project alone. <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. The same thing because it's very much tied up. The network is so global. Okay? So uh, if you have people of you like, people who do the, your agenda, you don't act against them. But we're talking about humanitarian thing now. I remember very well because uh, uh, actually I wrote my dissertation based on the 1984-85 famine in Ethiopia. And then during that time, I remember uh, President Reagan said uh, famine relief aid should not be given to Ethiopia, but Congress challenged him. This is a humanitarian thing. It's not politics. They are dying. These are this have nothing to do, the people have nothing to do with politics. Ult ultimately, even President Reagan has to yield to the demands of Congress and other progressive uh, elements in the United States. So they gave aid to uh, uh, Ethiopia in 1984-85. So, but intervention is something else. Now war is going on, famine is going on at the same time in Tigray. The United Nations Security Council should have intervened. Had the Security Council intervened, number one, the war is going to stop. Number two, they can reach out to the famine stricken people. That's the end of the story. But they are not in, they don't want to go in, therefore the war continues. Okay? So that's the way, I, that's how I see it actually. Yeah, if I may add, uh, because there is, uh, you know, so many issues uh, like, you know, onion layers after layers uh, in Abiy's uh, politics uh, and denial. Uh, one of the things is that uh, there is no internet, there is no electricity, there is no communication, and journalists and uh, free independent uh, observers are not allowed it's just to hide because the Eritrean involvement. Now it is becoming clear that the Eritreans are, you know, occupying a sovereign land of uh, Tigray, and uh, I, I think uh, mainly he is trying to cover uh, the <laughs> the involvement of uh, you know Eritreans, which accounts uh, over eighty percent of uh, you know the army, uh, because his army are uh, totally inhalated, destroyed. So uh, I think uh, this will be the major things that the way I see, you know, he is using her feminine as a tool, as a, uh, a weapon uh, to subjugate the Tigrayan people as well. But this is from the political side of, uh, uh, how do you see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're using both, you know, the thing is, uh, uh, like I told you early on, uh, they were unable to defeat the TPLF because had they completely destroyed the TPLF as they wished, as their original plan, probably things would have uh, gone different direction. But it's not going to happen. The TPLF is still actively fighting the Ethiopian forces, the Eritrean forces as well. By the way, you mentioned of the Eritrean thing. Eritreans, even today, when the whole world actually knew about this thing, they say, we're not involved, we're not integrated. <laughs> you 
And denial comes from the Ethiopian authorities too. Like Red One Mahdi, the Red One and all those people, liars. They actually are liars. They don't have any integrity. They say Eritreans are not there. Well, come on. The people know the world knows. Okay? So, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's uh, interesting, but uh, on the other hand, it's very sad to see that, uh, that by the way, this is uh, uh, something I never heard before that I have uh, 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 actually uh, wrote about it uh, in one of my articles. None, there was not, no such thing as a country uh, inviting another country to attack its own people, never. But throughout history, there were alliances. <laughs> the Spartans were allying with others against Athenians. Uh, the Romans were allying with another country for that. You can go on and on and on in history, but you would not say it's actually like, uh, I can give you a scenario, for instance, the United States, uh, mm, uh, if it was fighting Texas and uh, uh, inviting Canada, to attack Texas, both of them. Can you imagine? It would never happen, of course, in this country. But it's the same thing happening now in Tigray, Eritrean troops. But people have to see uh, in its uh, uh, broader context. What I mean by that is, it's not without reason Eritrean troops are involved. It's not without reason, if you remember, Ali Ahmed was shuttling between Addis Ababa and Asmara like going like incredible to Asmara. This was the whole agenda. They were preparing actually to attack Tigray. They encircled Tigray long time ago by blocking the highways. Now this was their agenda. If you also remember one time, Isaiah Safwarke, Abiy Ahmed and Formaggio of Somalia, they had a meeting in Bahardar. And what they've done then is nobody knows what they've done, but now it's a revelation. It came as a revelation. What they've signed then is uh, to contribute troops to their common war, the common war against the ground. So for Majo, actually now his assistant, as he told us today, said, because of our agreement, we've contributed troops to fighting in Tigray. And some of them have gone to Eritrea, trained by Eritrean soldiers. They brought them to Tigray, 400 of them, not the other thousands that came from Mogadishu along with the Ethiopian Defense Forces. The 400 of them, 300 of them, 380 of them are wiped out now. I'm not making up this. This was actually confirmed by the Somali government itself. You know, they say they lost 380 of them out of the 400. You know, Professor, uh, as a Tigrayan, I know you are a Pan-Africanist and a Pan-Ethiopianist. Uh, you know, <coughs> uh, your uh, adult life. Uh, in the light of this, uh, you know, what's going on in Tigray, uh, the plight of Tigrayans uh, is beyond imagination. And the silence of the Ethiopian people and the silence of the people who fought with you you know, during the uh, struggle, that you don't hear any voice, you know, to condemn what's going on. Even the rubber stamp, you know, the intervention of an outsider, uh, you know, in sovereign country. And now they were denying that the Eritrean troops were not there. But now even the Eritrean occupiers are admitting where we were invited to loot, to do whatever we want. <laughs> what kind yeah. of leadership? You know, what bothers me so much is as a Tigrayan, when you hear such kind of statement, what is left of me, of Ethiopia? Yeah. It's something beyond. That That's I true. Express myself. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can understand your, uh, your frustration and your, <laughs> your, outlook with respect to the leadership. But do we have leadership really in Ethiopia? We do not have it. Thus people should have, should really understand Ethiopia now doesn't have a leadership. And by leadership does not mean that one who leads 
the country or the people by leadership means commitment to the people and to the country. This leadership is not committed to the people and to the country at all. This leadership has another agenda, has nothing to do with the people. And you should not expect, by the way, other government agencies like the parliament and others to speak out and say, what are these Eritrean troops doing? On the contrary, the parliament in Ethiopia condemned the TPLF as a terrorist organization and invited, they were actually really very happy that Eritreans were involved in this war. But if you go back several years ago, the so-called Isat or whatever uh, people, uh, those television guys who are very narrow-minded people, they were saying, Isaiah support, they should support us against the Greek. Can you imagine? They don't even think twice before they speak once. They don't speak once. They've been doing this many times. Eritrean should come and help us. But anyway, the bottom line is this. Abiy Ahmed could not do it without Eritrean and Somali and United Arab Emirates support. If it were only the troops of Abiy Ahmed, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, you know what was going to happen. So they have to bring all these people. Yeah, taking to you reading uh, on Washington Post, uh, what is the likelihood of uh, uh, the global relief uh, aid for Tigray uh, reach immediately to those uh, needed? What do we do as a Tigrayans in diaspora uh, to put more pressure and highlight the predicament of Tigrayans? As you know, there is no internet service, there is no communication, and independent journalists and researchers or aid workers are not allowed to enter that area. What do we do? And this is happening, taking, taking you back to the famine. Uh, I was not here in Seattle, but Seattle was active uh, during the 80s. And I know a lot of people who were, uh, you know, uh, leading this effort uh, that I, uh, I was, uh, that I am not able to mention their names, but they are very close to me. You know, Pakistan, even they say they want to send the money directly to Derg instead of sending to yeah. <laughs> And things yeah. are happening. The same thing now, because their silence, that means they are not caring what's happening in Tigray. And I just, we are still, you know, committed to Ethiopia and all these things, you know, these things keep happening. Yeah, that's very true, that's very true. Okay, uh, the global involvement, global involvement uh, is gonna happen but it may not happen in two days. It may not happen tomorrow after tomorrow or in a week time. But uh, uh, as, soon as, uh, uh, as soon as Biden comes to the White House, it's going to change. The equation is going to change. Why? Because he's committed to these things. I'm not talking about American foreign policy now. American foreign policy in general doesn't change actually, but each leadership make a difference. Uh, the Democrats are, uh, uh, do have their own agenda with respect to war and others. They want actually to mitigate uh, wars and, and famine and what have you. Like Obama, if you remember, he was trying to make peace with Persia and others and others. It's the agenda of the Democratic Party. So they're going to do it. They're going to do it. And remember, America is the mightiest country in the world. If America sneezes, the whole world sneezes, they say. Okay? So that's going to happen. European Union, European Union has uh, several times requested that they want to go and reach out the people. Not only the famine victims, but other people too who, are, who need a lot of help in terms of shelter and uh, hospital and what have you. Okay? the European Union is going to be involved as well. So ultimately, even the United Nations, by the way, a couple of days ago, 
the, uh, the, 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 refugee, uh, the, the refugee camp in Tigray. This is the Eritrean people I'm talking about. It was targeted again, it was bombarded by, by, by uh, heavy artillery forces. They bombarded it. So the United Nations is very much worried about it. They are talking about it. So the UN, the United States, the European Union are gonna act. They may not act swiftly, but they're gonna act as uh, maybe in a week time or two weeks from now. They're gonna do it because they cannot wait anymore. If they do, it's gonna be extremely disastrous, but I'm sure they're gonna be involved. Yeah. This, is my, this is my thinking, okay? Uh, as you know, uh, I know you read a, a lot of uh, research and- uh, The voice is low, voice. Uh, read a lot of books and uh, you do a lot of research on this. Uh, one of uh, that I read so often is uh, Amartya Sin in his uh, seminal work on the economy development under the fact that women and, and starvation in the modern world are primarily a consequence of human actions. And he says, he commented that women, uh, women are in fact so easy to prevent. That is amazing that they are allowed to occur at all. Yes, that's very true. That's what I have argued, by the way, in my dissertation, the politics of famine and strategies for development in Ethiopia. Uh, sometimes the famine is, uh, uh, comes as a result of nature, natural calamity. It could, be, uh, it could be the absence of rain, it could be many, many things. But in most instances, it's actually man-made. Famines are man-made, really man-made because uh, instead of uh, doing irrigation, uh, you're waiting for the, for the, for the rain-fed agriculture. So we starve ourselves sometimes. And sometimes the politics, the politics actually, like we have already stated that now, we don't have to repeat ourselves. I'm not gonna repeat myself a hundred times. The governments make it a policy, food aid, would aid as politics for hungry people. So it's man-made again, okay? So uh, that's the thing, but uh, you cannot extract anything from this government in Ethiopia and the worst people in Eritrea who have starved their people and they have come to Tigray to starve uh, the Tigrayan people now, okay? Okay, some concluding thoughts anyway. Let's go for that. Yeah, I, I'm looking to uh, also some questions on uh, uh, because we are on live and that's what I was going back and forth. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is uh, in the light of all those difficulties that we talked about as Tigrians in diaspora, what we should do to elevate the need for it in a, a very timely fashion. What do we do? How do we press on to put it, uh, you know, in a first phase agenda? Because, uh, you know, famine is a most destructive weapon. In order to live, we have to eat. And as I said on the introduction, people are dying while they are sleeping because of famine. What do we do? I mean, the world is deep so far. Avi is getting away. Isaias is getting away. Not to mention the humanitarian disaster that is happening in our soil. You know, our users are being killed. Our mothers and sisters being raped. Our property is being looted. All this misery is happening. And the world seems to be a deep air, to take a deep air. What do we do? Highlight. Okay. That's a good, that's a good thing. But uh, look, uh, this is what we do. This is obvious to me. I mean, it's uh, uh, we people in the diaspora can do so many things. We've been lobbying uh, congressmen and state uh, senators. But with respect to food aid, 
if you remember uh, in one of the Tugrai Global Advocacy Group meeting last time, I came up with relief organizations, okay? We have to contact, we have to work with these relief organizations. Incidentally, when I was uh, doing research today, the Catholic services are already involved, okay? But there are many, many of them, hundreds of them, and NGOs that actually are, uh, do have an agenda in relief, disaster relief, sometimes famine, sometimes earthquake, sometimes it could be anything. So we have to work with these people. We have to lobby these people. You cannot, you cannot simply go to Tigray just like that with food and clothing and what, what have you. These are, the, these are the agencies that can directly contact the people that are stricken with famine, okay? That's the one. Another thing is the, is the United Nations Food Program. We have to lobby those people as well. There is also the United Nations uh, 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 Higher Commission for Refugees. We have to work with the Higher Commission of Refugees as well. Although their, 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 their uh, focus is on refugees, they also extend help to people who are internally displaced. As we speak now, there are close to 2 million people who are internally displaced in Tigray. They are out of their homes, their homes are destroyed. Their farms are destroyed. So they are completely uh, helpless actually. So via United Nations Higher Commission of Refugees, we can reach out these people as well. There are some Tigrayan diaspora people who came with a proposal that we should fundraise and do beyond them, all these things. I do not support that idea at all. Number one, the that. fundraising means there is no accountability. And with funds, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do really? The best thing to do is work with these agencies, uh, relief organizations. There are so many of them, Catholic service, Lutheran uh, organizations, uh, the United Nations Food Program, the UNHCR, you can go on and on and on. We really have to work with these people. That's most effective if we really wanna reach out uh, the starving people in Tagore. This is what we should do really. Uh, on behalf of the uh, cyber part of Tigray, I uh, would like to thank you, Dr. Galaudius. And also I like to pass a message here for our youth and the diaspora communities as well. Uh, today, uh, famine has been used as a weapon to subject uh, our uh, people. And I will call upon all Tigrayans in diaspora to read the social media to highlight the predicament of the plight of our, our people, especially when it comes to starvation. We should work as much as we did for the genocide to highlight what's going on in Tigray. Please. With use social media, those agency who can help us. This is also another war that has been waged against our people. So tweet, 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 highlight the predicament of our Tagaru. Keep the face. Thank you, CyberPower, for giving us the opportunity to address the issues that is a concern, not only for us, for all Tigrayans. And we appreciate the cyber power of Tigray for becoming a voice for the voiceless. Uh, and uh, I just want to leave uh, a few concluding remarks uh, to Dr. Galaudius. Okay, I almost done, but he just said it. He said it actually already. So uh, what I like to do is if possible, uh, diaspora Tigrans should also individually or in groups contact their Congress people, their senators, and uh, that, that helps us a lot, by the way, helps us a lot, because uh, this is the only way you can make a difference. On top of the other activities we do, uh, demonstrations and what have you, contacting Congress people is very important, very important and crucial. Thank you.